the person has gone through that experience and we're simply regurgitating the marketing material that we see on TV and how important it is for us to do our own research. Um, what we discussed in that sit down and I'm very glad Zero got a chance to be heard is for every person that's struggling, there's a person who's tried and failed. Mm -hmm. For every person who's, fight, who's tried and failed, though, there's a person who succeeded in their journey when it comes to therapy. I, but us as a community and us as an ecosystem, we do have a responsibility to call people out when they're not doing a good job. We do have a responsibility to touch on the fact that stories like my sister when she went to get therapy and the therapy conflated their personal experience with my sister's experience we have to call folks out and sometimes report them and sometimes follow up with them so the next person that comes after to get help doesn't receive that treatment due to the calling out either the therapist getting checked and realizing hey i need to do a better job or hold myself more accountable or teaching clients, hey, you have rights as a client when it comes to therapy and what that looks like. Hey, it's your boy Juice Shows from Get Home Safe and we're back with another episode of Housekeeping. This week has been a very sensational week. And the reason I say that is on Mental Health Monday, specifically Mental Health Monday, we released an interview with my, one of my folks and we titled it, How Did Therapy Help Me? This is a close friend who we've talked about being on the episode for a while. Um, she deals with depression and anxiety. He also deals with bouts with ideation and he opened up to me about the story of what his therapy experience was like for him as a child between the ages of around seven to about 10 or 16 into becoming a delinquent and how that affected not only his relationship with therapy, but also lends to his inability to want to comfortably get therapy. We talked through his experience of what was it like being a kid coming out of the foster care system? What it was like being a child who was getting therapy from different adults who were looking to help and were looking to label you as things that weren't necessarily correct for the situation and not understanding how his experience of being a kid coming out of foster care it affects not only his outlook on life, but his outlook on whether I should trust this thing called therapy. Uh, what's important about this story is not only the fact that he tried to get therapy when he was young and he had so many resources at that time, but it's very important to touch on the existence of betrayal early in a relationship and how that sometimes crusts over and it becomes something so hard that later in life when it's time for you to get help for yourself as an adult how it'd be hard to believe in why would this thing help me as an adult now when it couldn't help me as a child and as a teenager so what should be different now his experience is valid what he went through was valid I've had a couple of therapic friends who've reached out to me and said, you know, why can't he just get therapy? Or, you know, why doesn't he just believe in what the system has to offer now? And to that, I think it's very important that we do not discredit not only others' experiences, but what the system was before compared to what the system is now. When it comes to the therapy and when it comes to telling others, hey, you should go get therapy outside of just my organization and how we not only bring a grounded feature when it comes to mental health, but we also bring the realism of what does the pros and cons of therapy looks like and what is therapy before you get therapy, what is therapy after you get therapy and what are your expectations as a client and your rights as a client versus what are the therapists delivering and what do the therapists 
believe that they're bringing to life with the clients that they're doing this intimate work with and how important that is. In his story, unfortunately, I'm not bad. there was just so much pain. There was so much, how many different people did I have to relearn to trust? Because when it comes to getting therapy, therapy is the dating game. Therapy is the shopping around game. Therapy is figuring out who works for me and who doesn't work for me. And I'm very sure as a child who doesn't have an adult figure, I'm very sure as a child who hasn't even become a teenager yet, and then as a teenager that's trying to figure out the world, there's no way that experience from the age of about six or seven until about 15, 16 would have a positive effect on someone. I think it was very important to hear his story because it's very easy to be in a room and tell people what to do, turn on cameras, turn on lights, have these sets, have interviews and feel, well, since there's so many people getting therapy, therapy is what we should tell others to do. And the harder thing to do is to acknowledge, well, what does it look like when therapy doesn't work? What does it look like when the thing we tell people to get, they've gotten it before, way before we reached out to them and us as friends or associates or family members really try to be a part of a different section of this person's life when it comes to their health and hoping the things that we hear about in terms of mental health, the things that we hope would make a difference in terms of therapy and reaching out to therapists. What happens when you're in a situation where the person has gone through that experience and we're simply regurgitating the marketing material that we see on TV and how important it is for us to do our own research. Um, what we discussed in that sit down, and I'm very glad Zero got a chance to be heard is for every person that's struggling, there's a person who's tried and failed. Mm -hmm. For every person who's, fight, who's tried and failed though, there's a person who succeeded in their journey when it comes to therapy. I, I, but us as a community and us as an ecosystem, we do have a responsibility to call people out when they're not doing a good job. We do have a responsibility to touch on the fact that stories like my sister, when she went to get therapy and the therapy conflated their personal experience with my sister's experience, we have to call folks out and sometimes report them and sometimes follow up with them so the next person that comes after to get help doesn't receive that treatment due to the calling out. Either the therapist getting checked and realizing, hey, I need to do a better job or hold myself more accountable or teaching clients, hey, you have rights as a client when it comes to therapy and what that looks like. And it was something really important that stuck with me in that interview that I did on Monday for the drop, How Therapy Hurt Me. I think that that title of How Therapy Hurt Me is very important because a mental health is a measure of how good are we mentally and how bad are we mentally? What do we need to work on? What do we maybe need to be careful of? Are we surrounding ourselves with triggers? Trigger is a negative word. It's something that triggers you like pulling a trigger to a gun versus how do we cope? Coping would examples of coping would be like journaling. That's like a form of coping or form a form of dealing with things in a different manner that doesn't lead to something volatile or somewhat of an outburst now, outside of journaling, taking walks in the sunlight and really reminding yourself that there's life outside of the isolation that in moments of depression or anxiety is what you would tell yourself, but that's not always the right thing just because that's the comfortable thing that you go back to as things are happening. Wait. How important it is to acknowledge that I may burn bridges or rub people the wrong way, but in my search for wanting community around me and what issues I may be going through, that if you'd like to be my friend, this is a part of me that you're going to have to accept because I can't just leave my issue at home because it comes with me everywhere I go. But I am happy for the support that I'm able to receive in my journey when it comes to therapy, when it comes to not getting therapy, but coping with it in my own way. And what was most important about that conversation and that discussion that we had was 
coming to the solution of the suggestion that I don't know. Whenever he gets back into the market looking for a therapist, he should see if there's therapists that have a background when it comes to foster care kids. Sure. Seeing if that therapist has a background when it comes to the foster care experience and maybe maybe a therapist who's come out of the foster care system and if that would make an experience to someone who's not only relatable but someone that's willing to help you the suggestions the suggestions that they make would acknowledge the struggle that you've been through in a different way which may make you more inclined to believe in not only what's being said but how is that implemented in my life with everything else that's going on <laughs> when we put out those kind of interviews it's never about the most unpopular opinion or the popular opinion it's really about in these discussions that we have and there's going to be a lot of discussions when it comes to the rhetoric i do think that's in it, it is important to have the same story told from a different perspective until we learn as much as we can i would like to paint a whole picture not the picture i simply want people to see when it comes to just getting therapy I think it's very important to acknowledge there are people who are not able to complete the journey, not of their own fault, but maybe because of their experience and how they could have been handled better. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to share those people's experiences that don't believe in therapy because you can't tell someone to get therapy unwell, unless you're willing to go through that experience. And if someone has gone through that experience, we need to sit down and unpack what that experience was like for them until we get them back together all the way up to the point that they're willing to do what they need to do for themselves, whether that's go to therapy or not go back to therapy, but at least create a space that that person's experience was actually heard and acknowledged. And right now there's been a chain reaction on IG where I have a couple of therapists who I've done work with or therapists who I plan on doing work with that are reacting to that content because that is very important. That response is very important. Now there's a call to action that's going on on Instagram and a couple other platforms about what is our responsibility as therapists? What does it look like with the work that we're doing or the work that we're not doing? I don't. And is there a lack of empathy when it comes to the work as therapists and how do we fix that? And how do we come, how do we as therapists become a little bit more realistic about not only the handling of our client, but are we there to be right? Or are we there to walk alongside our clients? Welcome. As Jasmine said, and really we'll live their experiences with them and bring them forward to whatever the next level entails in their lives. <laughs> so with that being said, hopefully I didn't talk your ear off too much. I think it's very important to acknowledge this question that I was asked by it is, it is. One of the followers of Get Home Safe, known her for quite some time. I really appreciate the questions that she's been sending in because in all the work that I've done, I think it's very important to be questioned by the people that have supported us because it's very it's very easy to fall in the in love with the work that we've done so far and not really question what can we do better. What are we standing in our own way of not doing? or why things may have changed and really having a moment to explain that to the community itself. So a question that I was asked recently, I've noticed content being pushed out at a less frequent rate. What's the reason for this change? I think that's a great question. Um, so let me explain. Get Home Safe as an organization began as a campaign. Our campaign, Mental Health Monday, was posting content on the internet with me and two of my friends, Ryan and Coop, and we were creating spaces of vulnerability that didn't exist among those in our industry when it came to music, entertainment, and health. At that time, Ryan was working for a nonprofit. Coop was doing work with a record label, and I was running a couple establishments on U Street in DC. The reason we did that content is because we wanted people to start creating spaces to have conversations. Are you okay? Having conversations about are people getting therapy? 
we wanted to normalize the discussion of people's feelings. Now, right now in 2024, that might seem like, oh, that's just another, another day. But in 2018, 2019, 2020, the discussion of people's feelings wasn't as easy as a conversation back in the day as it is now. Around 2020, it was either 2020 or 2021, the band broke up. So I went from working with three people, including myself, and a fourth person, a very important editor in Machina Media, who he did a lot of the edits for a lot of the interviews that we shot. Uh, anything that was a concept, he was like the lead behind it when it came to recording. We still have a great relationship to this day. Shout out to Brooke. Gives me a lot of advice when it comes to editing, when it comes to the audio side of things, how we could make a cleaner look, what I should be concerned about when it comes to new camera and equipment that we're investing in and what my concern should be when it comes to the platform, the things that we're building now. And what we ran into was when you go from a team of four people, five, because we had some folks who would volunteer to get edits done or volunteer to get work done and it goes to one person the flow of work changed because i a, had to figure out what is get home safe gonna do now in terms of short and this was like bringing in short form content this was bringing in how do we make the content believable and this is also bringing in as someone who's an advocate for mental health how do I make things that are not only relatable to folks, but people feel they have something to learn here? And how do I give them something that will benefit them in their lives that they could walk away with and feel I could go back to that platform or the person behind that platform because they do care about what's going on in my life community wise. Good. So we started with shorts. Shorts was so much easier to create content. And most of the shorts that I made were based off of two things. The shorts that I made at that time in 2020, 2021, that was mid pandemic coming out of the pandemic. That was about what I had learned from the therapist that I did work with, what I had learned from real life situations that we had dealt with when it came to folks hitting me up because they had unalive thoughts and struggles, emergency calls, people who are reaching out to me for advice about depressive episodes or anxiety episodes and what that looks like. And it really changed into uh, how do I record conversations amongst folks that were interviews. So if you look back at the interviews that I did back in the day, and I think it was either called, it was either named get home safe, which is directly after the brand or mental health Monday. It was me sitting down at my house that I lived at the time off Georgia Avenue and just shooting one-on-one -on -one conversations. Then it evolved from one-on-one -on -one conversations to me being on camera with them and me learning other techniques so I could start taking care of interviews instead of dealing with folks who volunteered their times to get the interviews back to us, which also meant when people would volunteer their times, we would just get interviews whenever. So we were trying to figure out how do we make this consistent and what day did we want to do releases, changed it back to Mental Health Monday and Monday would be the day for releases. So that was just one IP we were working on. And then it went from Mental Health Monday to In My Shoes. Now you have two shows, right? And the process behind one show, which I think is really important is you have lining up the interview so out of your day you're looking about five people i may be interested in or five folks who've reached out to me and me having phone conversations with them and figuring out what are we going to talk about so what would the average person have to give to this platform that doesn't understand mental health what would the person who has had a mental health emergency or deals with the negative side of mental health what would that discussion look like and how do i keep their humanity and the topic and not just get answers and dehumanize that person as we have the discussion because that reality is very real for them and keep in mind that when I have these conversations with people I'm visiting moments in their life but I'm not a part of their 24 hour period that they're living including sleeping what they wake up to what they have to adapt to how anxiety affects their body how anxiety affects how they look at the world how depression affects their body how that affects how they look at the world how 
having thoughts of unaliving themselves affects their body and that and how it affects their look at the world and then send them home and you know maintain the that person is going to respect my experience and whatever they put out i have to be comfortable that i've let go that part of myself that's now out there as a face as a person as an experience and then you go into editing so that experience of lining up the phone calls that's like an hour or two just lining up the people and figure out who would be a good fit and then doing the edits after you shoot you shoot set up the videos and you shoot that's about an hour and a half per shoot and then when you go into the edits, the larger edit, that's like basically an hour and some change is how long these um, interviews would last. So the edit itself for the first edit is like an hour and a half to two hours. Then you render it, that's another hour, hour and a half. So then you're at three to four hours, including the interview, that's five to six hours. And then when you redo the edits in terms of adding B-roll, when you redo the edits in terms of going through the audio, that's 10 hours. You're easily sitting at about 24 hours. And then after that, when you do the final render, you then have to cut up clips for shorts. And these, clip, these clips for shorts, once you're done cutting that up, that's easily two hours, depending on the kind of interview that you had. Maybe three, if your computer's not fast enough or slow, you're easily going into 48 hours. And then after cutting up clips, you then have to spread it across three platforms. And all the content that we do here is spread across YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram. And so instead of the focus being strictly Instagram. The focus is now Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, just to make sure that there's somewhat either consistency or branding across the platforms. And then you had a show like In My Shoes. So that then goes from one process and you still have to go to work because you're working a 40 hour, 40 hour week. So you have 40 hours in a week for work. You have 40 hours in a week to sleep. And then you're left with 40 hours. I don't know if that math lines up, but that math sounds about right, I guess, because it's 24 hours. So all that is cutting into 24 hours to live, date, enjoy your life, manage shows, spread the content across three different platforms. And then you have the third show in housekeeping, which we're shooting right now. Content wise between edits storage you got to get a lot of sd cards getting money for sd cards cameras taking care of your cameras getting new equipment something breaks you got to replace it the content itself for three shows between mental health monday in my shoes and housekeeping that could easily run a little bit into 72 to maybe 96 hours depending on how you do stuff and one of my jobs they allow me to actually do edits on work on the work because they believe in the work that i do and they believe in the quality of the person that i've been so the reason content has been slowing out, has been rolling out much slower is because I'm the main person handling the content by myself when it comes to lining the meetings up, shooting, editing, having other meetings about how people feel after an interview, keeping in mind restrictions that people may have or concerns for some things that are coming out, re-looking content, making sure it lights up with the Google guidelines. You can't curse too much. If there's certain topics that you have to avoid on Google or you can get demonetized. And my channel isn't monetized yet, even though we're even though we're over 10,000 subscribers, but we still do have um, milestones that we need to hit on the hours side. And that turns into the consistency is going to be inconsistent when you're having all these ideas that are making an impact, but one person is handling them. So right now the system is getting better and I am getting a lot more consistent, but it's like, you know, I have a lot of IT things to work on between projects and folks that I'm doing things with and certs that I'm working on in my private life. In the meantime, after I'm done with these shoots, I got to go take three practice tests for a couple of certs that I'm working on right now. But between the CIS SP and a couple other certs that shall remain nameless, but it's just like, you know, when you put all that math together, that's why the consistency that was there before when we started has now become inconsistent because there are cases that I have to run episodes past certain people who said, hey, I'd want to see the episode and sit with it before you let it out because I don't know if I'm comfortable with that, but I'm glad I got to have the conversation with you. Um, and these are things that just come with the platform. I have files that have shorts I haven't released yet because by the time the week is up, it's like, hey, 
weeks up i gotta go on to the next episode and i would like for the shorts to either be consistent with the next episode or at least consistent with the topic and what's coming up we have suicide awareness month that's coming up for the month of september very important month i'm trying to figure out what kind of content i would want to work on that and whether mental health monday and in my shoes are going to be involved in that side of things is it going to be self-care we're going to talk more more about environment are we going to bring people in who i've talked to before and have their stories be told from a different angle when it comes to the faceless platform of in my shoes or the face platform of mental health monday and then doing those breakdowns for housekeeping like we do now and like that's notes so that means after we put everything out i still have to take notes on what are we going to review for the housekeeping episodes and how will that benefit either my followers or people that may be interested in the channel so the reason we've become inconsistent when it comes to the releases on the social media side when it comes to instagram and tiktok is because the youtube side has taken so much more attention and it's so much more of a larger beast when it comes to consistency when it comes to building momentum when it comes to doing the content right between the edit shorts and everything else it's just time consuming quite honestly and it's one person doing this you know for the folks who worked with me they helped me get get home safe started but that was originally my project that i wanted to bring to life which was mental health monday that turned into get home safe and this is what it looks like when you haven't given up on that first idea that really relates to you in the core and now i'm bringing on more people i just brought on this uh young lady dr jones she's a pediatrician i'm going to be doing a lot more work with her handling that relationship i'm super excited and looking forward to that and i'm trying to see what can we bring to life when you bring a platform that's been based in mental health the community anxiety depression on the live in terms of suicidal ideation and adhd and how do we bring a realism to the folks that work in that field professionally how do we bring realism when it comes to the folks that treat the symptoms of what's going on and the people who live that life and what can we do as friends family and associates for these people that we care about that are in our lives and how do we get back to what does it look like to do things correctly for the people that we love according to what they actually need as a person and not just what's in the textbook so this has been another episode of housekeeping i appreciate everybody that's been reaching out with good questions these questions have not only given me an opportunity to reevaluate things but it gives me an opportunity to explain things that i wouldn't normally be able to talk about in depth and i think that's really important like subscribe share thank you to everybody who's pulled up on this episode of housekeeping and, uh, and I hope you guys are having a great week. Uh, I've had a lot of good news, not so good news. I have a funeral that's coming up next week that, you know, for my boy Jalil, shout out to him, shout out to his mom, beautiful soul. She held me down when I went to school over at Catholic University of America. And these are things that I look forward to because as much as we do all this work, life doesn't stop. So if you have somebody that you love, pick up the phone and call them, hug them, kiss them on the forehead for me or for yourself. And, you know, outside of liking, subs uh, subscribing and sharing the content, if you have anything that relates to you content wise or any topics that you feel are really important that you've come across on this page, reach out and let me know. Let me know how we've helped. Let me know how we haven't helped. Let me know what you think we could do better. And, you know, just for yourself, I really hope that the content we're creating helps the people that are watching the channel. You did. Um, yeah, so it's your boy Juice Jones for Get Home Safe. Thanks for coming back to another episode of uh, Housekeeping. And uh, peace.